right? What song? Waterloo! Eurovision winners! Hey, um, I tried to find you during the coffee break. Welcome back, everyone. So, big, big thanks for doing the feedback with the coffee. I just saw the flip charts covered uh, in comments. So, really, thank you really much for that. Looking forward to a deep dive in them later. Now, I also had a really uh, interesting uh, discussion during the coffee break, and I was approached to do a little extra thing now. So, to just sum up with the next steps, what happens after we go home, uh, where do the recommendations go? We actually have some people here who are really important actors uh, who are taking over the process when we leave today. And these people are preparing the documents that will be adopted at the ministerial meeting in May uh, by the youth ministers. And those include this resolution that we've been talking about through the whole conference and the recommendations that you've been writing. And I would like to ask the attaches for the Council Youth Working Party to please stand up and wave. Jan, that is you too. Stand up and wave, please. <laughs> okay, here, here, here. Couple of people over there. Oh, look, more and more. Thank you. And I spoke to a couple of them during the coffee break, and uh, they were really impressed with the formulations uh, of the recommendations. So, bravo, really good job. Then, uh, Another announcement, just to clarify, those who are leaving and going to Copenhagen, uh, to the airport, they will be the ones boarding the buses and get lunch there. Those who are staying for the meeting should not board the buses to Copenhagen airport. <laughs> they should instead have their lunch in the restaurant uh, by the hotel here. Okay. And if you're uh, not sure, ask the organizational team. Cool. With that, uh, I think we can continue with the rest of the program. So I will ask Clara to please uh, come out and tell us what we're doing next. Yes, I'm bringing a few people with me who can already uh, join me on stage because we are now proceeding to the closing panel. And again, this is going to be a youth panel just as in the opening, but this time we want to uh, conclude the conference and look ahead. So we have the next representatives of the next trio presidency with us and of course the European Youth Forum and I will introduce them in a moment. But first of all, the topic of the panel um, is going to be taking the EU youth dialogue further, celebrating successes and identifying challenges. So we will talk about a few different things and I think we have a quite interesting question and I'm very happy about the discussion with you. So let me introduce to you the panel. We have Lore with us, who is from the Flemish Youth Council. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> representing the Belgium uh, trio presidency. presidency. Then we have, we have Jorge from the Spanish National Working Group and he was also a participant in the youth conference. So thanks for joining us. Cute. We also have Annie from the Hungarian National Youth Council. <laughs> and we have Christiana for as Vice President of the European Youth Forum. Thank you to the four of you for being on this panel and discussing and of course concluding this conference together with us. So let us start by taking a look at the current cycle, okay? So any you joined as a EU Youth Dialogue in the cycle and I would like to ask you how would you summarize, briefly summarize your experience of the ninth cycle? It was exciting, challenging, crazy, confusing, demotivating, motivating, and very complex, I A would lot say. of mixed feelings. <laughs> <laughs> and can you tell me, when you first joined, what were your expectations as youth delegate uh, towards the, the cycle and where they met, really? I was expecting that <coughs> I will have the opportunity to, to take a deeper look into how the processes of the policy making is going. And I have to say, this was fulfilled very much because I understand that I don't understand, which is already a way to go. Um, on the other hand, it was a lot about outreach work and working with young people and get to know like very different perspectives of, of young people. In that sense, I, I was very, very motivated, but at some point I had to see that it always could have been done more. 
and that was a very challenging feeling to deal with, that I know it could be always more inclusive, there could be always more people being asked, but where are the borders of the cycle? So it, it was definitely a journey of, of finding those, those borders, what is doable within the dialogue. I can imagine. And Hoche, as National Working Group member, um, you're, of course, also involved in the cycle, but in a quite different position. So how was your experience of the cycle? Were there specific uh, successes you, you celebrated looking back, but maybe also some challenges you came across? Well, um, personally, um, I think one of the biggest things we started the cycle with, and I'm sure that's going to resonate with a lot of you, we started in post-pandemic times, so that was the very first part of the experience of the cycle was heavily based on that. But later on, we also had lots of successes. So we were able to kick out, kick off after the pandemic. And we managed to have 200 participants in Spain heavily engaged with the program. We reached to more than 3,000 youth. And not only in terms of quantity, but also quality, we are overall very satisfied with the outcome. And in terms of challenges, again, I kind of feel like this is a shared thing. But as the ABBA uh, group said, Money, 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 it probably be <laughs> our biggest thing. Yeah. Uh, but also recognition from institutions and other stakeholders. Nice. We will dive in, into that a little bit more later on the challenges and how we can maybe also work to kind of um, improve in, in a few of the things. But first, uh, looking at more successes, hopefully. Uh, Laura, uh, what has been the impact of the current cycle in, in Belgium, especially when we look at sustainability and inclusion? Were there specific um, highlights you would like to uh, uh, emphasize? There were quite a lot of highlights um, with our national working group or the Flemish part, we wrote an advice for our government about climate education and climate communication, which was highly based on what we discussed here during the working group on information and education. Uh, furthermore, we, will, we are currently writing an advice on climate justice, which is also highly linked to, <laughs> um, to inclusion and environmental and sustainability. And we see that when we wrote our advice about in, um, education and information, we were invited to present our advice to journalists and to media makers. So people were very curious what we discussed and what was in our advice. Um, but to be honest, I am very curious what impact this cycle will have in two years. Because if I look now that, for example, the eighth cycle, we there things were mentioned about lowering the voting age to the age of 16 and now we see that in Belgium for the European elections we have a voting age of 16 and also in Belgium we also have a campaign about unpaid internships and the topic of unpaid internships mm -hmm. was um, mentioned in the seventh and the sixth cycle mm -hmm. so I think we can we already have quite a lot of impact now but the impact will even grow over the years. Absolutely. I mean, uh, to be honest, in the youth policy sector, patience is, is really a thing. And of course, being young people involved, we might not be there when, uh, you know, young people actually benefit from the things we've been fighting for. So it's nice to also see, see the reference to that. And that's a good transition, uh, looking at long-term impacts to, uh, to you, Christiana. Um, this is your 15th year youth conference, right? And, and the last one. The last one. Can we just briefly check uh, in the room, um, because I think there are just a couple of people maybe who have as much experience with the EU Youth Dialogue, who has been involved in the EU Youth Dialogue that long, more than 15 conferences? <laughs> Krista, <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> okay, oh. but also some of the ministerial yeah. delegates, people also who are involved in the Youth Working Party, as we saw earlier. Okay. So, but it's not maybe just a handful of people, so there is quite um, a lot of experience there uh, that is valuable, so we would like to touch upon that in the panel. Looking back at your first cycle, um, when you were a wolf, can you briefly tell what was your role in your first cycle? Yeah, first of all, let me say that it takes a lot of patience, <laughs> actually, to be involved in the process, because uh, as young people, we need and we want the change, but it takes some time until we achieve it. Uh, my very first youth conference was in the Netherlands in 2016. Mm -hmm. 
And since uh, then, um, I've changed many roles, but I remain uh, very close and dedicated to the process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now looking back at that first cycle, how, have you, how do you feel has the EU Youth Dialogue changed since then? I mean, we've seen it, it's always a roller coaster, is uh, what Annie said at the beginning. It's a process that is, by definition, a roller coaster of emotions, of stages, of contribution. But if we consider that um, we see now in action the effort that the presidencies are giving, for example, to the sustainability, so we have more sustainable youth conferences, or we have, for example, uh, recommendations uh, at the end of the cycle. So we don't have, as we used to have for each presidency, recommendations uh, and different thematics. Now we have the youth goals as well. Um, we have seen more of cross-sectoral cooperation, let's say. We still have some effort to do there. Um, we have uh, our researchers that they've given the whole, they've given the whole process a, a different level. Uh, we have some data there that they are very important, also for the national working groups, for the international non-governmental organizations, but also uh, for the uh, Commission and, of course, for the member states. Um, we've seen um, the national working groups to be further supported. There are some cases that the youth dialogue as a process helped them to build better relations either with their ministries uh, or their governments or the official representatives, let's say. Of course, that's not the case for all. Uh, still, youth dialogue is not a youth-led process to all. Uh, the, uh, to all of our friends out there, so we still have some effort to do there. Uh, but I want to keep a, a milestone to the process, which was back in 2018. We tend to forget it, but it's good for us to know about it, to remember about it. Uh, so during the sixth cycle, we managed to have the development of the EU Youth Goals. That was a milestone. It might end up as an annex to the EU Youth Strategy, but it's important. It's, uh, it's the highlight of the EU youth dialogue as the biggest participatory mechanism that we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a mechanism that brings together young people and the policymakers, and this is the goal. We need to co-develop policies. Uh, it's us, yes, the, yeah, the young people that we want the change, but it's also, I believe, uh, the policymakers uh, outside there that they want to do and contribute to policies that they reflect the needs uh, of the generations, of the younger generations. And that also reminds me of my, my first cycle in 2019. Uh, I joined in the presidency mid-cycle. And when I came there, I know we had uh, discussions among the youth delegates. Uh, why are the youth goals not mentioned that much? We need to work with the youth goals. And looking back now, I realized that when, when we joined, the youth goals were already an established thing. Like, we never questioned or uh, were wondering how and why they were there, but they were there and we kind of took them and really um, tried to advocate for their importance. So looking at the past cycle, I would say the youth goals have been quite present and I'm really, really happy about that as well. Can you tell us what is the real value of the EU Youth Dialogue from your perspective? What's the biggest achievement uh, looking back at the past years? It's, m it's in many layers and different levels. I mean, if we consider the national level, it gives this extra push to the national youth councils. Uh, first of all, to be recognized as the official representatives of the young people in their country, that they speak the needs of the young people there. Um, and the, this co-ownership of the policies also on a national level. So we see that we've created with the youth dialogue this collaboration between the national youth councils and the ministries or with other actors, that, let's say, that they are considered uh, policy makers, uh, but also on a European level. I mean, we've seen it growing. Uh, we've seen the process, especially with the youth goals. You've mentioned it as well. We've seen the process being more uh, focused. Uh, we don't have a bunch of recommendations as we used to be. And let's be honest, sometimes having a bunch of recommendations end up being only on papers. And that's not what we want. We want the recommendations to be followed up, to be set mm -hmm. as policies and to be implemented. 
uh, and I think we still have some effort to put there, uh, but to be honest, we've made uh, great steps uh, and we need to be proud. Uh, the e-youth dialogue is a co-ownership, uh, let's say, process. I don't say project, it is a project and we will go also to that because it takes some grants to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a process. It's a process that can also inspire uh, uh, collaborations, uh, something that we need to put some effort as well and something that we need to urge more ourselves as a European Youth uh, Forum between the National Youth Councils and the INGYOs, the International Non-Governmental Organizations, we need to see more uh, collaborations regarding yeah. the EU youth dialogue because it's not a process by its own. I remember back in 2017, no, 19, that we had this Youth Goals Laboratory project. It was a consortium of five national youth councils, including also uh, some other actors. And we managed there to, you know, we were, we wanted back then to push for the youth goals. So those are things that also take some extra effort from our side, all of us, not just the young people, uh, to actually make it happen. Yeah. And that's a good key word, you know, efforts um, in contributing to the improvement of, of the EU youth dialogue. So switching the perspective a bit back to the national perspective, Laura, why do you feel like the EU youth dialogue needs to uh, um, improve really to be better? I think we can have and we need to have a better representation and a better just more inclusivity and more diverse voices here both for on just during the consultations but also here at the conferences because direct representation works and we need it and if you look back to the discussions in the open space maybe briefly what uh, sessions did you join during the open space do you remember yeah i joined the transport session and the representation session okay. Um, if you look now back to the conversations uh, that have been taking place there, how would you like to see um, the, the continuation of the work on the outcomes of the, spa uh, of the open space format, especially now looking at your trio presidency, of course? Yes, with the trio presidency, we have a feedback group in which uh, 12 national youth councils are contributing to improving the whole youth dialogue. So everyone who has some feedback, come join it. Um, and there we are, our three main goals are making sure that all the participants, both youth delegates as ministerial delegates are informed and are prepared for the conferences, that there is more visibility about the conference and the whole youth dialogue process in general, mm -hmm. and that there is more, um, that there are more diverse voices represented here. And a lot of those things were also mentioned during the open space format. And so we, yeah, we just take all the feedback with us and we are working on it. Because um, yeah, furthermore, there are also youth researchers, re youth researchers who evaluate it and who are evaluating just the 10 cycles because mm -hmm. this presidency was the first presidency ever and now we're the 10th. So we want to, yeah, we want to address the challenges. We want to improve the youth dialogue and we want to work for it. So hopefully in for the 20th um, cycle, there is more representation, there is more inclusivity and there are just more people and more diverse people here sitting. Yes. Uh, Koche, if I might chip in there, you of course also participated in the open space format. Um, what uh, groups were you participating in and is there like a specific highlight, something um, you especially take out uh, from that conversation to the next presidency? Um, well, for me it was a wonderful space to really try to get the opportunity to talk about the organization of the cycle and how the things are internally and also to kind of separate a little bit from the just regular um, just specifically talking about thematics and also try to use that as a wonderful space to share how are we feeling and how could we better the structure. I enjoy a lot the one that was concerning how to uh, better the image of the program itself and how to make group cohesive efforts to uh, really have a cohesive and, and put together image. Nice. 
Now, any, if you look at this cycle, uh, let's be honest, um, things are not always perfect, and we have to admit, so uh, that's also part of kind of improving to look at the things that maybe didn't work as well. What lessons did you learn from the current cycle uh, where you would say uh, um, for the next trio presidency you would like to do things differently um, in that aspect maybe? I think one big lesson for me was the recognition of people and the work of the people who are sitting in this room because it's still a Wednesday in March, in the morning, and people are here and people putting time and effort in there, meanwhile being unpaid, but dedicated and motivated to do the work. I think mm. it's really crazy. It's a lot of effort and it needs to be recognized because I know that you made sacrifices, we all made sacrifices to be here, to talk to the professors, to talk to your boss, to talk to this person and that person that you can be actually present because it's not given. By having a better marketing of the cycle, I definitely do believe that this recognition could be increased and it would be some self-explanatory thing of yeah, I'm a youth delegate and I'm not going to be there. And the reaction of the people in the society around us, in the institutions would be like, yes, 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 go, it's important work, do it and go for it. So I think recognition of the youth delegates, recognition of the INGOs, recognition of the National Youth Councils is very, very much still needed and needs to be communicated outside of the cycle, out outside of the circles of this youth dialogue and youth policy making, but like everywhere. <laughs> Now, we've already touched upon uh, the next cycle a little bit. Jorge, give us an insight, uh, spill the tea, uh, because Spain will be kicking off the next cycle with the first conference. Can you give us a sneak peek into the topics that will be discussed at the next conference? Well, um, conversations are there, the machine is working, and I, I think we can already maybe announce the youth goal for the next cycle. But maybe it's better to have a little bit of anticipation, right? So, <laughs> a little bit, please. Building the excitement. <laughs> so, the next topic for the, in terms of youth goals for the next cycle is going to be youth goal number three, inclusive societies. Okay. And more specifically, well, yeah. yeah. Enthusiastic <laughs> applause. <laughs> and more, more specifically, um, although there's, again, conversation still in making and there's still lots of things to discuss. But I think next cycle is going to be a wonderful opportunity to talk more in depth about how to expand access to learning environments. Also, I really think it's the moment, the right moment to put the educators in the center of the conversation as well. And also, we're going to have lots of dialogue and lots of conversation about fostering social cohesion and especially, of course, with this uh, youth goal, uh, a lot of conversation regarding those youth who have fewer opportunities and who are not maybe in the center of the picture most of the time. I have to say, you know, it's been such a process and working on the continuation and uh, kind of the, um, the collaboration within trio presidencies to have one youth goal or two youth goals, but at least to agree on uh, priority topics that will follow throughout the cycle that now having a next trio presidency even connecting to a previous cycle and making the decision, no, we have to go deeper is quite impressive or quite interesting. Why did you decide on focusing on youth goal number three? What was the process in, in the trio presidency? So, of course, a lot of factors just came into play because uh, this kind of decision takes, there's a lot of perspective and we listen to a lot of opinions, but we kind of jointly felt like this was a very good opportunity to keep on developing all of the conversation we had about inclusion in this cycle. And of course, environmental was such a big topic we would had over the past few years. And for us, instead of just taking this opportunity to kind of change the tone and go to another different space, we kind of felt like we still had some work to do in terms of inclusion. And we also felt this was a very good opportunity to maybe go a little bit deeper in some of the aspects. Uh, inclusion sometimes can be uh, a pending subject, and we really want to satisfy all of our needs of just asking and really having a very good image and a good picture of what the youth needs in terms of inclusion are. So, yeah. Nice. 
I very much look forward to the discussions really there. And I mean, it would be bold to say that we could solve issues related to inclusivity, but also sustainability within one cycle. So this is really an opportunity now to dedicate even more time to going deeper. Um, any, how would you like to see young people being involved in, in the shaping of the next cycle from your perspective? From my side, I would be super excited if the rural youth would ha have given uh, or like could get a bigger voice within the whole process. Because what I see that like rural cities might still get a little bit of representation, but there are still so many people who do not get their voices heard and they still need to get to the city and in order to get into the conversation. And I also hope that the policymakers' doors are going to be open for young people. And it's not going to have to be always asking, 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 and please let us in for talk, but also open invitations sent out for conversation starters um, from, from the policymaking side. And you touched upon um, the importance now of recognizing uh, youth delegates, NGOs, other stakeholders in the process. And you're absolutely right because they are on here on a voluntary basis. But we've also talked about the role of ministerial delegates during the conference. Um, looking at the reflections that have been started here at the conference, um, where do you see the role of ministerial delegates in, in the next cycle? Where would you like to see them contribute also? There are two aspects on the one hand on the e within the organization process on the other hand within the participants of the of the member state in the organizatory process I really hope that it's going to be a cooperation it's going to be clear roles between NYCs uh, national agencies and ministries in how to operate in order to make a make the conference itself just as inclusive as it's possible but the whole planning process itself on the other side I really wish for this cooperation on the other sides too, that it's not national working groups meeting twice a year and saying that it's it's a cooperation, but also you, the youth delegates knowing the people and also seeing the people behind the workforce and getting into conversations in behind forced settings with the dialogue, but also on the topics which needs to be discussed. And there is going to be like space and openness for that. Okay, interesting. Um, now, kind of taking a broader picture um, at the whole, you know, process again, Christiana, um, do you feel like we are on track with the EU youth uh, dialogue? You know, this is kind of the half time uh, of the EU youth strategy. Do you feel like the EU youth dialogue needs to change in some way to kind of reach the objectives um, that were agreed a couple of years back? Or are we on track? We are on track, but changes need to be done. Uh, we are changes? entering now the 10th cycle, so it, it should be a remarkable one, uh, not just for the uh, framework of it, but in the core of it as a process. Uh, and um, I mean, if you consider that we've changed even the name, I mean, how many of you uh, did you know that it was used to be called structure dialogue? So we've changed the name, actually, uh, so as to make it more uh, sexy. And we, <laughs> remain it <laughs> we rename it into the uh, EU Youth Dialogue, also to be more understandable. But beyond that, we need to also make the process to strengthen it. I mean, we have the policymakers, we have the young people, and we, make t we need to make understood that this is a co-ownership thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so. At the moment that we are demanding things, our young people, uh, at the same time, policymakers should be on the same pa uh, table and listen to us, but also, also contribute to the discussions. And that's why we're here, actually, to the youth conference, because we need active delegates uh, from all the uh, spaces in order to have recommendations that they are co-owned. Uh, but of course, we need to support the national working groups. Uh, and by that I mean uh, not only financially, we want more financial support. Uh, national youth councils need more financial support, especially the national youth councils that they are uh, under the trio presidency for each cycle. 
is not enough to have a grant just for the implementation of the project. They need also this extra funding to support the presidency uh, in their maximum effort to do the best of their work. Uh, but also we need national youth councils to be empowered uh, in a way that they will have more actors on the table. And here we also want as a European Youth Forum the international non-governmental youth organizations that they are doing an excellent work into the process, they contribute into the process, we tend to forget about it, they don't get any financial support, but they do, they are here, how many of you are here representing INGYOs? Can you raise your hand? So they are here, they are contributing to the, uh, to the process, and that's why we consisting on supporting them also financially, also to be sustainable. We are keep talking about sustainability. Sustainability have many elements, a part of the green environmental aspect. There is also uh, the sustainability of volunteers, and uh, also let's not forget about mental health. Mm -hmm. Dedication, as Annie said, I mean, you can see it all over the place, but it's volunteering, dedication, and volunteering effort, and somehow needs to be rewarded, not by money as such, but put to put the grant on the process in order to be sustainable. And uh, also, an outcome of the whole process uh, it's the EU Youth Coordinator, and we are more than happy that we have the EU Youth Coordinator. And we strongly believe, at, as youth representatives, that there's space there for further improvement of the role of the EU Youth Coordinator. Uh, we want the EU Youth Coordinator to further strengthen and support also their role, but also the uh, EU Youth Dialogue as a process. And, um, of course, we need to mainstream. Mainstreaming has been always a target and a goal for us when it comes to the EU Youth Dialogue. That's why I started by saying we renamed the process, the project, but uh, we still need to mainstream the, that thing. Can you maybe clarify a bit in, term, uh, in the sense of inclusivity, how does mainstreaming practically look? Can you give us a few examples? So we need, first of all, to communicate to the outside world that we have this process. This is the first step. Unfortunately, we are still there. We need to communicate to young people with fewer opportunities that probably are beyond our radar that they need to know about this process and that they can change their policies by contributing into the whole process. Um, but it's also uh, mainstreaming is, is, a, is an effort from both sides from ourselves as young people, but also from the policymakers. We need to start talking the language uh, that, is an underst that is understandable for all, meaning that when we have youth conferences, for example, they need to be inclusive for people with disabilities, for people uh, not being able to travel long, or for people that they probably don't live in cities and they live to rural areas. Uh, so, I mean, I can bring up a list, <laughs> but um, I feel like we are on the very good track. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to have some trust. We need to have some trust to the process. It's been here for quite long. We have experts into this uh, process, and we need to show some trust to young people as well. Yeah. We need, as young people, to feel we are trusted in order to actually contribute further into the process. Can I ask you on a personal note, what has been your highlight of your journey being involved in, in the EU Youth Dialogue? Because I know the process is quite close you know, to your heart and the engagement you've been doing. Uh, yeah, today is very mixed emotions for me because it's indeed the last conference, but I think the peak uh, and the highlight moment for me uh, was when we had the EU Youth Goals. Uh, it's a milestone. It's still a milestone for the process, and I hope that we will manage to achieve a similar milestone when it comes to the follow-up and to the implementation of these uh, Youth Goals.
I really hope that the things you've highlighted and you mentioned will be continued, kind of the legacy will be continued, maybe to also add the question, who will take over uh, from, from the Very good day? question. Can I see my colleague, Nicolas? Can you maybe stand up? So Can uh, you stand up? <laughs> So, Nicolas is, uh, I'm passing on to him the EU Youth Dialogue process from the board of the European Youth Forum, but I would like also to ask from my uh, very close colleague, Christoph Pav, to stand up and to applaud him for all of his work because he's a person responsible <laughs> for the EU Youth Dialogue. <laughs> So it's kind of, a, uh, at least in the European uniform, but a legacy of process, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, carrying that was being carried on. So no pressure, Nicolas, but mm -hmm. uh, you will be fine, I'm sure. What is your uh, recommendation for the youth delegates? Um, a tip you can give them? I heard something yesterday uh, during the play that we went to see. Uh, it's not enough to be on the table. Sometimes you need to shake the table. And that's my recommendation to you. <laughs> now my final question to all of you, and I uh, very much like the question. Ondra proposed it um, yesterday. If you had all the money in the world, what would you change about the EU Youth Dialogue or the EU Youth Conferences? Any, would you like to go first? I really love the idea of this one train taking us all on the conference. I think it would be a nice prep um, for the conference. Um, I think having all the money would lead to actually getting into super sustainable ways and showing an example to the outside how something can be done. Um, so I would definitely go for the train. I would go for the sustainable and expensive for now, let's hope it changes in the future, travel options. And yes, I would pass on, on you for the creative events to continue. <laughs> so Laura, there's still a lot of money left after any is done. What would you <laughs> yeah. do? But wait, are they are shared? Not 10 each? All the money in the world. Ah, you all can the money. Okay. <laughs> endless budget, the dream of everybody involved in youth policies. Yeah, I have three proposals. Uh, the first is better participation by f uh, reimbursing youth delegates who don't have the um, possibility, who don't have the time, who don't have the money to be here and to spend three days at a conference like this. And also um, by making sure that there are translators who can be here so that people who don't feel comfortable speaking English uh, also have the possibility to be here. Secondly, I want uh, a better implementation by making sure that there is more cross-sectoral lobbying and also by funding the INGYOs so that they can lobby at the European level. And thirdly, I want better visibility by making sure that the TRIO presidency has, for example, a communication officer. Nice, lovely. <laughs> What would you be doing? Well, jumping on the last thing, I really think that if I had an unlimited supply of just money to spend, I really have a very ambitious communication strategy. So not only being able to together uh, share in a way that reaches young people and it's young friendly in terms of language, but also be present not only on social media, but also newspapers, and but also um, as well in like the broader civil uh, space conversation. That will be a very important thing. And um, besides that, I think we could also better our efforts in terms of inclusion, not only with language, which is a wonderful thing, but also try to get people and try to make the participants in the room be closer to the actual presentation of the youth. So for instance, uh, have more deaf or ha hard of hearing delegates and also provide support for them uh, or for the visually impaired as well to actually make this space uh, as friendly as possible for them. And besides that, uh, which I think that are very important, and I think we will still have lots of things to do in terms of cooperation within the, the different national working groups in reality. So I'll probably create spaces 
like this one where we can meet together, but without the rush to actually create a document, but rather to strategically think where are we heading and to really have a moment to get to know each other and to live a little bit outside of the constant changing pace of the program. Yes. And Christiana, what would you increase spend the your money on? Increase the grants for the national working groups <laughs> and the national youth councils, give money to the INGYO so as to run the process, create uh, a communication team that will follow the whole process constantly, um, create maybe part of the increasing of the national working groups to be also uh, an amount dedicated for follow-up uh, teams that they really care about the outcomes and they keep insisting on a national level or a European level for it. Bigger delegations to the youth conferences also from, uh, uh, from beyond uh, our continent, I would say. Um, yeah, I have more, but... Uh <laughs> <laughs> it's the commission also here, so... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, uh, all your wishes, I mean, Im have imagining a conference and the EU Youth Dialogue Cycle, having all these things in, I think this would be really the ultimate goal. And I feel like it's not 100% unrealistic, maybe mm. the scope of things, but the message behind it is uh, very clear. So thank you uh, for sharing. And thank you for, for being in the panel and for sharing your discussions. I hope that um, some of your ideas will be at least implemented in the next three-year presidency. And I wish you much success for shaping the next cycle. And I look forward to the continuation of our discussions um, later on. Before we move to the handover, let's maybe take uh, a selfie because I was requested uh, yeah, to yeah. take a selfie. Let's take a selfie, all of us. All of us, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> For no, the memory book. Up. Yeah, please stand uh, up. Yeah, maybe stand we up. We take several times and we will merge it. Right. Where are we going? And maybe also try or to maybe squeeze together a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe like this, so oh people my God. I'm coming on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Are you closer or...? We need more people there. Yeah. Oh, they are coming here. Oh, they're coming. <laughs> cool. Mobility and solidarity. That looks nice. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Mobility in action. <laughs> and action. So, yeah. Okay. Smile, everybody. <laughs> EU Youth Dialogue. Let's shout it. Okay. <laughs> Youth <laughs> participation. <laughs> Nice. Okay. A big applause for the panel. <coughs> and I believe at this note, having uh, looked ahead uh, into the next cycle, I believe this is the perfect moment to uh, initiate the handover, which is really the last part of this conference. So I would invite um, the Swedish uh, representatives as well as from the Czech Republic and Finland to join us on stage for your handover. Um, yes, it's time for the official handover. Um, it's definitely a bittersweet moment. We've had a great nine cycle, but as we've just heard in the youth panel, you guys are well prepared and also very excited. Um, makes us feel good, right? Yeah. Um, but before we hand over officially, we would just like to uh, have the opportunity to share our best moments from the cycle in general, but also um, maybe from the conference, we'll see. What about you, Maxim? Yeah, for me, um, one of the biggest achievements uh, would be uh, during the cycle in France, we have the national level of the EU Youth Dialogue. And uh, we have, like, uh, the campaign is named Provox. We have, like, our own campaign with, uh, with this name. And uh, we have a festival, uh, which is, like, the, 
the same form of this uh, EU youth conferences. And uh, we gather uh, all young people from all our national youth association uh, that are part of the Youth Council of France. And they are here with us for three days, speaking about these same thematics that we are dealing with. Um, they are just uh, following the whole cycle uh, like we are doing. And I, I was in the workshop uh, regarding governance, and I think this is a concrete example of how we can uh, uh, you know, create uh, opportunities for young people to engage at a local and national level, and after maybe bring them here in EU youth conferences. And so this, uh, this festival was a, a, yes, a, a great uh, winning for us uh, with big outcomes, uh, some really good feedbacks for the national level to work with, with our ministers. And uh, I can just uh, encourage you to do the same. And uh, it's really great as a youth delegate uh, to be able to meet with these young people and see uh, the smiles on their faces. As they, are, they are feeling that they are uh, yes, uh, useful for the community and uh, for the European level. So yeah, just uh, we should create lots of opportunities at local, national, and European even. Thank you. Definitely, and maybe you can hand over the mic to, to Christina so she can also share her best memory. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Emma, for this, uh, for this little space and final remarks, kind of, from the Czech presidency. Uh, for me, personally, it was definitely the conference in Prague, obviously. I think I have a lot of good memories on that, and I'm sure you have too. <laughs> but uh, within, within this conference here in, in Sweden, I think it's the great resolutions and the recommendations we finally uh, got together, at least in my group, information and education. We were really fighting for each word of, uh, of the recommendation. And I think it, the sign that we are so passionate about it, just it will stay in us kind of, and it, we will take it home because as I said in the opening panel, the, the work doesn't end here, it only starts. So you still need to reach out to your local politicians, to, to, to the people in the ministry and keep the good work going. Another thing I have here for the, for the Swedish presidency is that uh, I've uh, taken something with, for, for myself for the <laughs> next time and I uh, hope I will, uh, I will have it right in the, in the next uh, youth conference in Sweden. Can we hear you try? One last try. Vecke. <laughs> <laughs> close, close. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and for me, reflecting on the, the Swedish presidency, it's obviously not over. Um, we will still be working with, with the end of the cycle, but it's the last conference. And I would really like to emphasize how, in my understanding, I've really broadened my understanding of the conceptualizations of these youth goals as we've been working on. Um, I've had my, my preconceived ideas and the ones that have been shared um, with me through the consultation process. And being here has really broadened that uh, view, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, so that'll be my final reflection for, for this conference uh, and all of the exchanges of information and opinions that we've had through these uh, very good um, discussions and negotiations when it comes to arriving at these final recommendations. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of evaluation as well, but there's one question that we have really missed and has not been brought up by Alice or Clara or anything else. So I would really like to show you, I need your hands up in the air. What do you think about the weather in Sweden? <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. What would you say? Wow. Do, okay. You guys are way more positive than I expected you to be. <laughs> um, if I turn over to you guys, what can you tell me about the weather in Spain? Well, <laughs> I think it will be a good time also to announce where are we going to have a next European We're very youth excited. conference. Oh. And also when. Yeah, yeah, a little bit off. So I don't know if you know about a city called Alicante. Woo. But we will probably see each other there from the 1st to the 4th of October. 
of this year, so a little bit le more than just a year, uh, half a month. Paint a us a picture. What would the weather be like? What should we pack? Well, my personal recommendation is that you bring a swimsuit. I know that it's October. I know, but <gasps> bring a swimsuit. <laughs> there was one thing on your list now, bring a swimsuit, but you're very exposed when you're only wearing a swimsuit. <sighs> Can we help you with something maybe? Maybe. Maybe, know. maybe. We have a very symbolic, but also mm -hmm. super practical gift. Wait, I have to look through my magical bag here. Um. <laughs> ah, here we go. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> well. <coughs> it may be better if we all share it. Now, right? <laughs> I'm used to it, but... Thank you so much, and also thank you, uh, and this is speaking for the entire trio, for organizing and putting together this cycle, and especially this very last conference. It's been a blast. We wish you all the best from the ninth cycle and on to the 10th cycle. Can't and wait. <laughs> <laughs> and we are also very excited to see you in Belgium uh, in March 2024, and to celebrate with you the 10th cycle, and you can already guess how we will celebrate it. And we also cannot wait to welcome you in Hungary in 2024 20, autumn. And do not forget, it's not just going to be the end of this cycle, but it's also going to be the closing of 10 European Youth Dialogue Cycles. So, looking forward. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>y más concretamente por el excelente trabajo que están llevando a cabo durante su presidencia del Consejo de la Unión Europea. Como saben, España asumirá la presidencia del Consejo de la Unión Europea el próximo mes de julio. Por ello, es un placer intervenir en representación de nuestro Gobierno en esta Conferencia de la Juventud, para poder exponer nuestros objetivos y prioridades en el ámbito de la juventud. Durante la presidencia española del Consejo de la Unión Europea, Queremos contribuir de manera efectiva a la definición de una Agenda Europea de Juventud. Una Agenda Europea de Juventud capaz de concretar instrumentos y mecanismos eficaces que nos permitan hacer realidad los objetivos y propuestas elaborados en el marco europeo para sentar las bases de un modelo social que nos permita, en definitiva, tener en cuenta e impulsar el futuro de la juventud de la Unión Europea. Para ello, trabajaremos por reforzar la coordinación europea y la cooperación entre los Estados miembros, con el objetivo de que la Agenda Europea de Juventud sirva como legado de los aprendizajes logrados durante el Año Europeo de la Juventud y como fundamento también para los próximos pasos que se deberán dar en la Unión Europea en el ámbito de la juventud. En este sentido, los principales objetivos y documentos que desde el Gobierno de España perseguimos en materia de juventud durante nuestra presidencia son los siguientes. En primer lugar, nuestra intención es llevar a cabo la elaboración de unas conclusiones del Consejo para impulsar la Agenda Europea de Juventud que garantice el pleno disfrute de los derechos de las personas jóvenes en la Unión y les sitúe en el centro del compromiso europeo. Estas conclusiones estarían sustentadas en los siguientes tres pilares que permitirían dotar de más peso, de más funcionalidad a los elementos ya existentes en la Unión Europea en el ámbito de la juventud. Un mayor peso de interlocución y seguimiento de la Coordinadora de Juventud, que ya contempla la estrategia, dándole un papel todavía más relevante, 
la sistematización de evaluaciones de impacto con enfoque de juventud sobre las distintas políticas europeas sustentadas en un cuadro de indicadores consensuado entre las instituciones y los representantes de los Estados miembros, el fomento de la participación de la sociedad civil, civil joven en la definición e impulso de la transversalidad del enfoque de juventud en las distintas políticas públicas dentro de la Unión Europea. En segundo lugar, en línea con lo anterior, queremos impulsar también una resolución del Consejo sobre Juventud y Salud Mental, para poner todavía más el foco en este tema de vital importancia. En tercer lugar, en relación con la evaluación intermedia de los programas Erasmus Plus y Cuerpo Europeo de Solidaridad, queremos impulsar una resolución que promueva la implantación de la Estrategia Europea de la Juventud y destaque el impacto positivo de ambos programas en la juventud europea. Es probable que esta cuestión se aborde, además, en una de las sesiones de los grupos de trabajo de juventud que tendrán lugar durante la presidencia española, así como el planteamiento de las cuestiones relativas a la juventud en las zonas rurales. Para terminar, eh, permitidme que os adelante el calendario de eventos y reuniones que tenemos previstas en materia de juventud para la presidencia española. Aprovechando que os encontréis celebrando la Conferencia de la Juventud, os anuncio que del 1 al 4 de octubre tendrá lugar en la ciudad de Alicante la Conferencia de la Juventud que se celebrará durante nuestra presidencia. Os animamos a venir a todas y a todos y esperamos que podáis acompañarnos durante esos días en España. Asimismo, celebraremos las siguientes reuniones. La reunión informal de ministros de Juventud, Educación y Universidades, que tendrá lugar en septiembre en la ciudad de Zaragoza. La reunión de directores y directoras generales de juventud que se celebrará en octubre en Alicante, haciendo coincidir una de las jornadas con la conferencia para que vuestras voces sean escuchadas. Y también, y por último, el Consejo Formal de Juventud que tendrá lugar en noviembre en Bruselas. Como he tratado de exponer a lo largo de mi intervención, el compromiso del Gobierno de España con la juventud es firme y durante el semestre de nuestra presidencia del Consejo de la Unión Europea trabajaremos por seguir reforzando los derechos de la juventud. Para ello, esperamos poder contar con el apoyo de todos vosotros y todas vosotras. Muchas gracias. Big thanks for that video greeting and we are of course looking forward to the next conference already. For our next speaker, we have a guest from the European Commission. And it's not anyone, it is the Director for Youth Education and Erasmus Plus. Sophia Eriksson Water should please join us on stage. Welcome. Thank you so much. Actually, I will start uh, by thanking, because there's a lot of people who have been involved in these last few days, and I think it's, it's the good moment in the concluding session. First of all, thanks to the excellent moderators, I must say, they've done a marvelous job. Um, but I would like, of course, not because I'm Swedish, as I happen to be in the home country or where the presidency is, but um, I would like to give a special thanks to the Swedish presidency for organizing this impressive event. We know it has a lot of uh, challenges to simply organize such big conference and making sure that there are enough rooms and activities and uh, good discussions. And I think uh, I can hear from colleagues and, and delegates that you have done a great job. So thanks for that. I would also uh, give a special thanks for the social programs. I could not be here the first part, but I certainly very much enjoyed the the theater play, very, very thought-provoking. And sitting there in the audience being above a certain age, I kind of felt pretty guilty, actually. Um, but thanks, uh, uh, it's been a, a, an enjoyable ride so far. I think it's the, uh, the occasion also to, because we're concluding on the ninth cycle, so it is not a one presidency achievement. So. I'm trying to look where we have the previous presidencies in the room, but I think it's also worthwhile to thank the previous Czech and the French presidencies, because this is clearly a collective effort uh, of several presidencies making up the trio and making sure that the cycle um, works from the start till the end. So we have an impressive ending of this ninth cycle, and of course the presidencies is one part of the story, Commission is another part, but the real work, and we've seen it once again, is done 
by you, by the youth delegates, and all the governance part, uh, which is part of the youth, EU youth dialogue. I admitted, uh, we talked in the, in the break, that when I joined and said, you, you will have youth policy in your portfolio, and I asked a colleague, can you explain to me how it works? And then I had this uh, big mapping and a long talk for probably 10 minutes on the governance. And I said at the end, sorry, I, I don't understand anything. What is all this? The steering committee, the national working groups, the youth councils, and the trio, and the commission, and all the youth delegates, and the conference, the cycles. I, I really thought it was not an easy uh, task to grasp. So I want to also thank all the youth delegates, especially the new ones, uh, for being here and for taking on the challenge to trying to grasp what this is all about. Um, now, uh, perhaps also I want to, I don't know where you're sitting, but I, I was so uh, touched and I'm really grateful that also the president, presidency could invite the Ukrainian uh, deputy minister in charge of youth and sport. I think that was so valuable. And I know where, I don't know where the Ukrainian youth delegates are, it's great to have you here, <laughs> important. Now, uh, also this morning, we have learned a lot. I've taken many notes of this feedback session and the high number of uh, very well-formulated recommendations. Also interesting to hear the insights that it's not always an easy ride to come to agreed uh, wording, but you have done it, so again, uh, impressive. So we have some good recommendations on the table. <coughs> And perhaps this is not so surprising because the topic is so self-evident. This is so uh, pertinent, important for the present. Yes, unfortunately, already for the present, but of course also for the future. So what else can be import so important than the social dimension of sustainable development? Now I want to look back because um, although I also was a beginner in this uh, EU youth dialogue uh, some years ago, but having looked back in the beginning of the ninth cycle, um, it was a, a strange cycle. And I think the panel, the concluding panel also touched upon it. Um, we, had, we came out in the end of the post-pandemic, uh, finally come out to the post-pandemic world uh, when this uh, cycle kicked off. And that was of course extremely rewarding to reconnect and, and have the physical version of the EU youth dialogue. And we had uh, uh, a full 2022 European Year of Youth, which was an excellent opportunity to put the spotlight on what we are doing here. And, and I'll come back to that. But, and that's a big but, we also witnessed um, a horrible war in Europe uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So in so many ways, this ninth cycle was a bit of a peculiar one. But what we saw when we, uh, we were under the European Year of Youth, we had, of course, the spotlights on the different youth goals, but we also asked young people, what do you want to see? What should we focus on under the European Year of Youth? And the biggest topic, not surprising, but the biggest topic was about youth participation. And I think this is what this is all about where we are today. Because young people, feel there is a lot still to do, it's clear. And we heard young people actually recalling the importance of opportunities for influencing decision making on the one side, but also have equal access to these influencing opportunities. But luckily we have this great tool at EU level, what we now call the EU Youth Dialogue. It's true it had a different name some years ago, the Structured Dialogue but it shows it has evolved and taken hopefully a, a stronger face in the meantime. And sometimes we discuss with our youth delegates because we try to see, what, is this a uni unique tool? And I think we can conclude that it is clearly the biggest youth participatory mechanism within EU, but I'm wondering if it's not also on that level on a world stage, because I have not heard of such uh, a grassroots level anchored process uh, that is really youth-led and leads up to the uh, national and EU level of such big uh, youth participation efforts. So that's something, we have a great tool at our hands. 
And I think we heard at the panel, it works pretty well already, but there's a big but al always, and I spoke to some uh, delegates in the coffee break, there are things that we can surely do much better. Um, <coughs> from the Commission side, we are a lot in a reflecting mode. Uh, on the EU youth dialogue, we observe and we hear and, and we consult, and I'll come back to that. What we can see, and I would echo actually and agree with some of, uh, of the comments made during the concluding panel, I think we can still do much better in terms of making this dialogue even more participatory. I would say also more transparent, probably also more visible. It's true that not, not everybody that should be aware of this uh, great tool is aware of it. We can do be much better there. I think there's also, and I hear it, it's still a feeling that the ownership from the youth sector is not 100%. It should be a co-owned process, but you need a sense of ownership from the youth sector. So I think we can work a bit more on that. How can we do it? And luckily, we are also in the process here of, of reflecting of what did we achieve during the European Year of Youth, and we call it the legacy discussion of the European Year of Youth. And I think this coincides quite nicely that we can take some new ideas and takeaways on how to improve the youth dialogue, and we bring it into the reflection of the legacy of the European Year of Youth. Just for the administrative part of the European Year of Youth, the Commission is obliged to uh, present a report on all the achievements of the European Year of Youth. We have a bit of time because this is a big harvesting effort. We need to know what has happened national level, regional level, local level. So it takes a bit of time and we are doing this at this moment. It's the harvesting time. And we will present the report by the end of this year. So that's uh, perhaps an interesting fact of yours. And just to give you one example, actually the European Year of Youth, we managed to have 13,000 at least registered flagship activities covering s in 70 70 countries, so it's spread m even beyond the EU here. From the Commission, we, we managed to table up to 100 youth-related initiatives, which is quite exceptional, I would say. It's not every year like that. And we managed to identify and mobilize uh, 25 of our EU programs and instruments that would have a youth angle. And this total amount was almost 130 million. So it's quite impressive. But we need to do something with that. And that is my invitation to you now as well. You need to help us in co-create a good legacy of the European Year of Youth. And we should link it, of course, to all the, uh, the existing tools and mechanisms that we have, which is the EU, in particular the EU Youth Dialogue. In case you have not seen, but if you go to the European Youth Portal, you will see we have published there a dedicated youth survey that has exactly this intention. Try to harvest and gather input from, uh, from your perspective of what we should do in terms of a legacy of the European Year of Youth. There's also a so-called stakeholder consultation. So you have out there now also a, a call for evidence where more organized youth organizations can also take part. Now, why is the timing so important? It is because we have the midterm review of our EU youth strategy. And it was mentioned during the panel. It is a good moment to take stock of everything that we're doing. So this timing of the midterm review is also by the end of this year. So you see, you start to see the pattern. <laughs> when you are in the administrative uh, sequencing, you need, to, you need to consider this as an opportunity. We have uh, new insights from this ninth cycle. We have the legacy discussion on the European Year of Youth, and we have the midterm evaluation of the EU youth strategy. Hopefully, this can all uh, feed into each other, and, and we can have bigger impact in that way. So, <coughs> again, I really I wanted to commend again uh, the presidency because I, I noted, uh, you know, we have talked of, of the different themes, the sub-themes that you have presented recommendations on, and for those of us who, who kind of follow the draft of this so-called resolution of the Council uh, that will summarize the outcomes of the ninth cycle of the EU Youth Dialogue, it's very positive that the presidency has taken its role very seriously. They have left total blank. There's nothing prepared 
because they were waiting for the recommendations of the conference. There, there are five uh, spots where the idea is to bring in the conclusions of the conference into this uh, section. Um, and to me, having now read the recommendations you have on the table, I'm not so worried, actually, from the colleagues from the Swedish side. You, have an, you will have a quite easy job, I think, to uh, translate all this into, into wording that fits into this revolution. But, 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 the challenge is, of course, how to make sure that there is some kind of continuation of this conference, we have the cycle, and of course of these conclusions, once they are tabled and hopefully adopted by the Council. A continuation of all the results, of all the good ideas, and even a continuation that leads to impact. I think this is something that we come back to at each youth conference. It's a difficult question, but we need to remind ourselves each time, can we be better on this? And again, I hope the European Year of Youth will actually help and just for the, for the new ones, a big, a big uh, revelation under the European Year of Youth was this so-called word, word mainstreaming that I think was mentioned in the panel. The, or we can call it cross-sectorial, even cr intersectional, I don't know. We have used different words. In the, there are probably nuances to this. <coughs> but the fact that this youth conference pronounces it say, as itself on issues like uh, sustainable public transport, of course, there's a limit uh, what policy colleagues in this room, also the youth delegates who are not in charge of transport, what they can do. But the, the secret is, of course, to make sure that there is a feedback loop to those who are decision makers in the respective policy field. So I think that the word mainstreaming is something uh, that is definitely have to be a legacy of the European Year of Youth. And that will ensure this continuation and the impact. Now, luckily, when one youth dialogue uh, closes, there's another one open up. And uh, I must uh, admit, I have the uh, same expectations as I think the panel expressed. And great to hear some uh, novelties and uh, revelations, actually, of the 10th dialogue. And when I hear what the next tree has in mind with the Spanish, the Belgian and Hungarian future presidency, I'm sure we will have a very successful 10th dialogue. So thanks again, and uh, all the best until next time. Thank you so much, Sophia Eriksson Watershoot, for that. We have our final closing speaker from the Swedish presidency. Please help me welcome the State Secretary for Ministry for Health and Social Affairs, Petra Nureback. Thank you so much. Is my microphone on? I think so. And uh, your microphones have been working here today. Uh, your recommendations have been heard loud and clear. Uh, and I believe that this will all feed into the DJ meeting uh, that starts today and that it will also have ripple effects far beyond what we are discussing here in Växjö. So, dear youth delegates, state secretaries, European Commission representatives, director generals for youth, EU youth conference participants, I am so thankful and honored to speak to you today. I want to take this opportunity uh, and speak to the youth delegates directly. I want to express my utmost gratitude for all the hard work that you have been putting into this conference. Because let's be honest, the success of the EU Youth Dialogue depends on direct involvement of you, of young people and of youth organizations. Because the fact of the matter is that everyone remembers what it's like to be young, but not everyone knows what it's like to be young today. And you are one of the most educated and politically engaged generations. But your generation is also facing a series of social and global challenges. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has had severe impact on young people and has also increased inequalities between young, uh, groups of young people. And furthermore, Russia's war against, of aggression against Ukraine 
the energy crisis, the global inflation, has serious effects on young people and communities in Europe. These are circumstances that affect young people's living conditions, the power to shape their own lives, and inclusion in the general development of our societies. So a priority for the Swedish presidency has been to highlight the social dimension of sustainable development. This, of course, includes ensuring the rights of all young people, especially those with fewer opportunities, to participate meaningfully in the development and implementation of policies that affect them in all political areas and also in society at large. But the social dimension also underlines the relevance of health and well-being. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of counteracting both mental illness and loneliness among young people. This is a fundamental precondition for young people's ability to reach their full potential. And it also la lays the foundation for more equal opportunities later in life. So to succeed in this, social inclusion is key. So uh, let's go on and talk about what we've been discussing during these days. One of the main focus of this EU conference has been the implementation of youth goal number three, inclusive societies. And I was very happy to hear that Spain plans on continuing the work with that goal. Uh, but it has also been number 10, sustainable green Europe. And listening to your messages and uh, recommendations here today, I'm impressed uh, and inspired by your insi insights and engagement when it comes to these goals. You have contributed to a deeper understanding and broader perspectives on the needs and ideas of young people in Europe. When listening to your summary of the outcomes of this conference, I am struck by your commitment to include voices of all young people and your proposals on how to achieve a more sustainable future for them. And you have highlighted those who are most marginalized within our society and identify the need for more structured consultations with young people through, for example, local youth councils. You have underlined the need for formal recognition or participation in volunteering and learning mobility to further work towards a, an inclusive, sustainable growth in Europe and you have stressed the importance of accountability and transparency in pol uh, policy-making processes to make sure that environmental policy is done with active involvement of future generations. And it is impressive that you, in this room, have made sure that we can leave this conference with five very concrete recommendations on a more inclusive and sustainable Europe for youth. That is exactly what we hoped for when we started arranging this conference. And of course, another focus of the conference has been to contribute to the development of the EU youth dialogue that we are all very proud of, but that we all see can be developed further. Our democratic societies need young people's participation, both as future actors of change, but also as important actors here and now. That young people can exercise influence and participate in political decision-making processes is necessary for the endurance of democracy and for the social cohesion in our societies. The EU Youth Dialogue has the capacity to support this, but we must be open to improvements to allow for more inclusive and transparent process with enhanced feedback. As, you, as has been mentioned several times here today. The work done during this cycle will have an impact when implementing and ev evaluating current youth policies and designing future youth policies. Your recommendations on how Europe can be improved for young people in the area of inclusion and sustainability, as well as your messages on the EU youth dialogue as a process, will feed into the Council resolution on the outcomes of the ninth cycle of the EU Youth Dialogue. And the resolution will then be discussed and hopefully approved by the Ministers for Youth on the Council meeting in May, with the aim to influence cross-sectoral policymaking in Europe.
This is important work. You should be proud of yourselves. So, Sweden is the last presidency of the current trio and has the honor to summarize and conclude the ninth cycle of the EU Youth Dialogue. We will now hand over to the 10th cycle under the presidency trio of Spain, Belgium and Hungary, as you all saw. Uh, and I want to wish the three of you uh, every success during your presidencies. We are at your disposal, of course, should you need any help or advice. And finally, I just want to congratulate you all, all the participants here on the insightful outcomes uh, of this conference and of this cycle and to a job well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the speakers. Can we give them one round of applause more? <laughs> Okay, it's time. It's time. It's time. We did all the things on our agenda. Now yeah. it's our time to shine. Yeah, yeah. Time to, to wrap up, to say the last things we wanted to say, and then to leave the stage. Yes. So let's start with one thing. I want to uh, suggest that we just warm up all of our energy to a massive applause, and then I will list everything we're applauding for, and we'll do a huge round, okay? okay? So let's see, let's thank our amazing tech team. They are the ones, no, 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 okay, warm up, warm up, just like do, yeah, yeah, good. And this maybe, you know, a lot of energy, so you see everything that we want to applaud for. Amazing tech team, they made us look good, they played great music, everything runs smooth, they document, like everything, but you don't even think about just because it looks so amazing, right? We also want to thank the National Youth Council, LSU, my home organization. I'm so proud of you. Well done, really. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank you to the Ministry for Health and Social Affairs for great cooperation in this and the, all the prep work you, we, we know because every one of us has been in contact with the organizing team and, you know, planning this like warm up more applause, right? And then thank you to the Agency for Youth and Civil Society for being here, for being part of the whole program, for uh, entering like the whole EU youth bubble in Växjö, that's their uh, base for the whole agency. Thank you to the facilitators for helping us figure out what to say, for the harvesters for writing down what we said, and for the researchers for telling us what we said, right? And thank you to the panelists, to the guests, to the speakers. Thank you, Clara, our oh. European facilitator. And now all the delegates, thank you for being here, right? Applause. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yes. What a cycle it has been. We had 18 months, two youth goals, two phases, three conferences, hundreds of delegates at those conferences, and a thousands of perspectives contributing to this cycle, all for engaging together for a sustainable and inclusive Europe. This has laid the foundation of an ongoing process. We heard that Youth Goal number three will be taken forward to the next cycle. And also the EU Youth Dialogue is still in, you know, a changing process as it has always been. So there is still a lot of work that needs to be done, but we can be proud of the work that we did already. And I'm really excited to see the results that will come out of the cycle and that will come out or result out of the work that you did. And I just want to emphasize again that change needs time, you know, and this is part of sustainable action as well to work on something where future generations will profit from. So I really want to also personally say thank you for all the people who have been involved. And of course, thank you, Alice, also for being my co-facilitator in this conference. It's been lovely. Thank you. And for me as national facilitator, it's such a joy and honor to be invited back and to do this after being a youth delegate myself. And I have the biggest respect for all of you uh, who have been here, who trust this process, who commit your time to this and your energy and your early mornings and your late nights. So thank you so much. And these spaces are so crucial. 
they're needed, they're supposed to be the, the main focus of where we join together and exchange what we want for the future for youth in the EU. So let's invest in these settings and continue being here, being active and participating all the way through. Yes. Alice, I never asked you, what's your birthday wish for the 10th cycle? So, okay, so my wish, I approach this from a bit of a different angle, but I figured like I'm turning 10, I think I would like a membership in a youth organization. You know, I'm an adult now, two digits. It's time to grow up. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the youth dialogue as a 10 year old needs to uh, develop a bit, you know, grow into its age. Nice, okay. My birthday wish would be, uh, you know, I've profit personally, I've profited from the EU Youth Dialogue. It has empowered me in, in a lot of senses, and I would wish really that more people would get to experience the EU Youth Dialogue, not just on a European level at the conferences, but from local to national to everywhere, to have more diverse people being there and sharing their diverse perspectives in the cycle so that we can also address these needs. And I kind of wish that all our wishes come true on the both walls. You can take a look what the wishes could be and let's see in 10 years time when the youth dialogue uh, turns 20, where it will be. I think that's it from our side. And there's just one last to do on our checklist. Yes, let's take a group photo, you guys, okay? And we would like to ask you to join as closely as you can in this middle section right here. So everyone is too high up, come down. We'll have a photographer join us here from the stage, okay? We did practice that during the selfie, so yeah. just be very cozy. Look like you've made some friends. <laughs> and we will turn on the lights and make you look beautiful. Great. 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 Please, all to the middle section. Come here, there's a lot of space here. Move to the right. Move more. Awesome. No, you can, you can all stand. I think that should be fine. Yeah, stand is nice. Then you get a little closer. But please, yeah. everybody move within the middle section of the plenary. Also, the bubble up there, move into the middle section. Good. And a few more filling in this gap over by Adam. Adam, wave and tell people to join you. Very good. <laughs> okay, almost there. Sorry. <laughs> the <laughs> first row, can you all move one step or one seat to the left? <laughs> Very good. Yes, yes. Perfect. Some more. Some more, some more. Can you move the first row? First row, can you move a little bit more? Beautiful. Great. And now, I mean, we had the feedback session already, so now look like you had a good time. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> show all your enthusiasm. Say cheese. <laughs> Say vecra. Vecra. Okay, maybe show some excitement and some applause before we conclude. <laughs> Woo. Are you done? Aww. Thank you, everybody, and have safe travels home. Be safe.